it says it's recording. We will see. All right. All right you ready? We're ready to go. All right. All right, River Church. Uh, I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine and a, a great man and uh, just a guy who can help us maybe um, get some perspective uh, in these moments and help us uh, move forward and actually be the light that Jesus calls us to be. So I want you to say hello to Fred Lynch. This is Fred Lynch. He is a writer, speaker. Uh, he's, he's a pastor. And, and a little fun fact, he is, was part of one of the original Christian rap groups, PID, Preachers in Disguise. I used to listen to you when I didn't know you. Back in the back in the eighties, buddy. Um, well, I used to rap to you when I didn't know you. So this is cool. <laughs> I'm well, glad Fred, I got a chance to know you, man. I uh, know it's been so good. I I got to know Fred through you specialties. We worked together and spoke all over the country and got to be friends that way. And Fred, you actually came and spoke at my church in Tampa, Florida, one time. Yes, do you remember I did. That? I remember it. I had so yeah. much fun, man. Yeah. Yeah, you were that. there to do. I think the core the training and then you stayed and spoke for youth group it was it was awesome so yeah very cool to have you hey um these are uh and, and fred's coming to us from dallas right Dal yeah, I'm dallas, in dallas Fort Worth area. Yeah. um these are crazy times um all over the country um and i think a lot of people in our church at the river are asking a lot of questions uh and they don't quite know uh what to do they don't know. Uh, they are outraged by the death of George Floyd, um, and uh, but they don't know what to do, and maybe they don't even understand exactly the uh, maybe some of the 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 outrage that's been there for longer, or the outrage that people are even speaking of on the news or whatever. So I was wondering if you could help us, kind of process through as a church that's predominantly white um help us process through uh what do we do where where do we go from here and and uh what can we do and maybe help us with um a little bit of uh how do we uh how do we understand this sure because i think for a lot of people like we were talking before before is that a lot of people like me growing up we thought that we thought that um, like racial issues and, and systematic racism and things like that ended with Martin Luther King. And that's kind of what we were kind of taught, but um, obviously that's not reality. So if you could help us unpack all of that, then we can have a little bit of a dialogue around this, those things. Well, Mark, once again, thank you for having me uh, just sure. be connected and get a chance to connect with your congregation. Thank you for trusting me to be able to uh, uh, share with you and share this pulpit time. Um, these are alarming times. And I like to use the word alarming because I like the analogy of an alarm clock. Now, the design of an alarm clock, when it's designed, like people right. are sitting in a room and designing it, they're like, okay, what are we going to use to alarm or to wake up people? Now, they, they, they purposely design within the clock the anno most annoying sound, you know, the most thing that will pull a person out of sleep. Right. Because while a person is sleeping, they could say, <clears throat> this sleep is so good, I want to continue it. And then all of a sudden, there has to have something has to happen to break them from that sleep. Now, if, if, if most folks are like me and whoever designed the alarm clock, they designed it for, for people like me because immediately I hit this extra piece called the snooze because I don't <laughs> want to let go of right. that sleep. Right. And so what I do is I try to hold on as much as I can to the sleep, but the alarm is designed to annoy and wake me up out of the sleep. In fact, what the alarm is telling me is that your sleep time is over. It's up. It's over. Now I can hit snooze and I can say, no, I'm going to go back to sleep and I can try my best to get back into that place of sleep, however deep I was, however deep in the zone. And I can make a whole campaign to say, I'm going to make sleep good again. I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to make it great again and go all the way back to where I was. But the reality is I can't go back to where I was because progression has to continue to happen. I got to get up. I got to get dressed. I got to go to work. I got things to do. Life goes on. Right. So in the same sense, that, that same analogy, I think what's happening with us as a nation is that we are being awakened. 
by something that's really disturbing our hearts and our spirits that's deeper than just uh, the horrible, horrible death of, of another black man. Another right. person, another man of color saying, I can't breathe. That within itself alone is horrid. It is, right. it is terrible. But what's the underlying motivation that continues to allow that to perpetuate? That is what's tearing our hearts apart to say, we have to wake up as a nation. We have to wake up and come out of the slumber, out of the sense of everything's okay. Everything is not okay. And the more we try to sleep, the worse things that we'll continue to lose. If right. I stay asleep, I lose my job, I lose my family, I lose my opportunity to advance. And right. so God has given us a great opportunity to awaken and shine true light on the so, situation. So most people, most people, mm -hmm. uh, unless there's something seriously wrong with them, they would agree with you and me that that was horrific. Uh, the death of George Floyd was horrific. But it, it goes deeper than that, like you're saying. It goes deeper than that. So how does a person, once they wake up, what do they, what do, they do? What can, what can they? Right. What, That's a good question because one of the first things we want to do immediately, you know, we want to fix the situation. But right. this situation is so thick and so deep. Uh, it reminds me of the story. Uh, there's a story in Ezekiel, and I think it's kind of like around the third chapter or so, the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, where he is taken into this group of exiles. And the scripture actually says that he testified. He said, I didn't even want to go. I didn't want to go with these exiles. And it says that the spirit drove me. So he went uh, kind of against his will. And then when he got among the exiles, this is what it said, instead of him immediately preaching, telling them what was wrong with them or tell them what was wrong with the system or tell them the Bible says that he sat among the exiles and get this. The scripture says he sat seven days saying, yeah. that. now you and right. I know, cause we're Bible nerds. Okay. Right. That when the Bible uses something like the number seven, that's for right. completion. completion. So he sat right. to a level that he was completely identified with these exiles. And that's when he arose to give a word. And of course, that great word he gave, if you read that passage, was the great passage that we get the idea of the watchman that sits on the wall to right. tell when something is wrong. Look, we would have never gotten that analogy of the watchman that sits on the wall and how God so beautifully showed that analogy of what a pastor is, what the people of God are, those that sat on the wall for the safety of the land, if this man wouldn't have sat in this place that he didn't even want to sit, but he mm -hmm. sat among them to feel their pain. And I think that's what's most important. Mark, yourself, you you sent me, as soon as all of this happened, man, you sent me a text and just said, man, I'm sorry about this. I love you. And, and, and then you said, I don't know what to say. Listen, you saying, I don't know what to say was powerful. It was, right. it was, it was what I, it helped me because guess what, Mark, secret, I don't know what to say. In right. fact, I've said so many things as right. a black man. I, I, re I have two children in their 20s. I have a young black male in his 20s. Okay. Yeah. Like, what uh, do you say to them? Yeah. yeah. And I've said things over and over right. and over again. I've sat in a car with my son where he saw me got pulled over for going five miles over the speed limit. And I said, okay, I'm going to show you how to speak to police. You get pulled over and he saw me do it time and time again. Why? Because I want to teach you this. is So I've said all of the right things to be able to say. So, so I've said the right things yet, you know, seven, eight days ago, nine right. days ago, it will probably be now that th this is airing. Yeah, yeah. I open up my social media and see it again. And when I saw it, I thought not again. I wish I could say the right thing to make it all change. But to have someone in solidarity with me to say, I don't know what to say either. That means something because we're both gathered together. And when we're gathered together, and especially if we focus on the name of Jesus, Jesus said he'd be in the midst. And I believe that as we in solidarity come together and in pain, we, we, we hurt through this together and process through it. We heal together and we can rise out of this just like Ezekiel with a word for our nation. So, so if you were going to tell someone a couple steps, like I, what I hear from you, you there is first, like sit with people, 
sit in their pain, don't speak, just listen, right? Would you say those are a couple good? I, I would say those first, are some first good steps. first steps to first do. Step. Where do you sit. go? Where do you kind of, where do you think, you don't have to have all the answers, sure. but where do you think you go from there? Like what, what, how do I, you? I believe that, that that's a great question. Where do you go from there? I don't think that there is a uniform answer as well right. as where to go, because this is so, uh, how, what's the best word I can use? There, there are so many different routes to it. You know, what main route do you cut off? I think what you really have to do is you uh, develop, relationships and relationships with people that are different from you, people that look different, that act, that, that think differently. And you right. learn to stay in the room with the tension. Right. So many times we just want to stay in our silo silos and the people that see like us, think like us, act like us, look like us. And, and sometimes in order to have a strong, healthy diversity, we got to know how to stay in the room with tension and just have, uh, I, I think, three things. Have By the a, way, I like that. I like what you just said, with tension. Stay in the room with tension. The you, first can't, thing, you can't eliminate all the tension. You can't eliminate all the tension. Well, the I love first that. thing I think you have to have is you got to have a curiosity. You got to want to know. There are people who don't want to know. And that's right. the reason why we're in this case is because people are just want to close it out, just act like it doesn't happen. And there are people that don't want to know, and we've got to know. So have a curiosity, a healthy curiosity. Number two, learn how to stay in that room with tension. Stay yeah. there and don't try to dispel the tension. Don't try to answer. I, I like to call them sitcom answers. You know how you see a sitcom and in right. 30 minutes there's a problem and there right. is a, a laughing about it and there's this solution with right. about three or four good commercials in between them. <laughs> and and if, if life could be uh, answered sitcom, through right. sitcom truths, then right. we would have a long time ago answered all the questions of life. Right. These are not sitcom. These are like long series of truth, yeah. volumes of truth that we've got to walk through. So we've got to learn one thing is to sit in the room with tension. And then the third is, I, and I love this idea, is that I can't bring the best of what I see and the way I look at it and compare my best with maybe your worst maybe some vulnerable right. parts of how you look at life and how you see things. And then I bring my best and I compare it with your worst. And then I, then all I'm doing is convincing myself that I'm right and you're evil, you're wrong, and you need to get on my side. No, right. I need to sit with that tension. I need to be still and I need to be curious and ask, why is this like this? One of the greatest tools, if you guys want a really good tool, is to start out a question with this. I'd be curious to know. Then ask that's them. good that's a good word man that's a good word and uh you know i think all of that takes proximity too you got to be yes, it does. you got to be close to it and you've got to and and to be honest you know sadly as a white man i've got to intent where i live i've got to intentionally choose that right and a lot a lot of people are so wrapped up in their own lives that they don't make time to intentionally choose to put themselves in proximity with people that are different and um, and I think that's part of, you know, the separation uh, just, you know, breeds fear, right? It just breeds fear and, and abuse and all kinds of things. And, and, and ultimately, right, we all need Jesus, right? The one who brought us all together, right? And, yes. And the one who says there's neither, there's neither free or slave, there's neither Jew or Greek, there's neither male or female, like breaking down every barrier yes. uh, between us. And, um, Man, I love your heart. I've always loved your heart. And love the you way too, you Mark. speak, the way you speak. I love your heart and your hair. I love your <laughs> hair, man. Yeah, look at that. There was a day when I had hair. It wasn't quite <laughs> like yours, but it was, you know, you got some amazing hair, bro. Thank you. But I love the way you speak truth. And I love the way that you uh, that you that you listen, you listen to to people like me who just you have patience just to say, you know, there's this. I've, I've been on this quest probably for about the last 20 years to try to understand yeah. this. We've had some good, we had some good talks, Mark. We've yeah. Some good talks. Because I, <laughs> I remember I got to sit next to you. I got to sit next to you and watch that Clint Eastwood movie, which had the, <laughs> Oh, the, Torrington. The, the, what was it? Torrington? No, it was, it was, it was uh, Grand, Grand Torino. Grand Torino. 
which oh which my has, gosh which had the most racist comments in it and i sat next to you and you oh, were yes you were so amazing during that i was so uncomfortable but you were you you were just seeing it for what it was and yeah oh my well, gosh i mean I was, what what a great what a great movie like if anybody i would encourage you guys as a congregation like walk through that and walk through the right. evolution of the right you know, that community and what happened it's like that's everyday life that's found and his journey his journey. Yeah, the journey yeah the journey was Clint yeah. Eastwood's journey in that movie was amazing because he started out as a complete racist and yeah. then because he had no proximity to anybody right. that he hated he really didn't he they were might have been in his neighborhood but he didn't know anybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until it wasn't until he got involved in a young person's life that he really started to understand and love somebody who was very different than him that's it that's it i mean i think that is the whole god story for god so loved that he gave is that right. there is no way that you can get in proximity with someone and build right. relationship and not eventually want to know them more want to sit in the room with tension and want right. to connect with them and fall in love with them i mean if you got god in you and you go where god is needed Okay, out in those streets, out in those places of people hurting, and you actually open doors, you'll see God move through you in ways that are unreal. That you're like, right. I can't even believe that God would love through me. Right. He's, he's, he's waiting to love through you. Right. And people that are within proximity, you may not think that you know someone that's close, but you, I mean, you could simply just pick up your phone and just go, go to connect with people that are on your phone network. Find somebody. That's what you and I started doing. We were right. together, especially in this COVID, you know, not right. lockdown. We're not next to each other, but heart wise, we right. were able to get close in this right. time of pain. And right. Mark, you know, as a result, I'll always remember that. So you always Thanks, remember man. those who were in the trenches with you when things got tough. Right. That's what well, it's Fred, all I, about. I appreciate you speaking to our people. Thank you so much. And thanks okay. for. Uh, for being a part of this. I know they will appreciate it. And um, hopefully, man, we just, we hang in this together and we do make a more perfect union, right? And more, that's, that's, a more perfect, that's what we can do. a more can perfect do country as much as we can. So thank you for your, thank you for your ministry uh, over the years and, to, and your ministry right now to me and, and to the people watching us. So thank you very much. All right, man. One love, bro. All right. All right. Good. Oh, I got it. That's good. Let me see. Hold on. I gotta figure out how to stop this. Stop. She's like, none of it recorded. We gotta do it.